Hello, dear foodie friends, and welcome to Kitchen Chat. This is your host, Margaret McSweeney, and I'm so excited to be here today at Kendall College meeting the iconic, legendary pastry chef, <laughs> Chef Francisco <laughs> Magoya. Welcome to Chicago. Oh, thanks for having me. This is a, I love coming to Chicago. It's, a, it's one of my favorite cities, for, absolutely. Well, you have so many accolades, and and just a bit of your background. You grew up in Mexico. You have a, a Spanish, uh, Italian American mm -hmm. influence, and you have worked as pastry chef at some of the top uh, restaurants around the country, including the French Laundry and Bouchon, and mm -hmm. the list goes on and on. And for the past four years, mm -hmm. you have been baking bread yes. and listeners you're not going to believe this we are going to learn from the expert of the modernist bread the art and science how many holes are there in a loaf of bread mm -hmm. what is the sad story mm -hmm. about the american rye bread mm -hmm. and what is the future of bread and why you think the future of bread is better than the past and we're going to delve into the past of bread and discovering the taste so this has just been an incredible project for you listeners and you can see and viewers you can see this five volume book along with this nice takeaway <laughs> <laughs> recipe book uh -huh. the 50 three pounds it's 53 pounds yeah yes and 1200 recipes it's 1200 recipes uh, let's see it's 2642 pages which is 100 pages more than Martin's cuisine um, so <laughs> um, and you know for a project this big uh, the last four years uh, was a combination of developing recipes but also doing a lot of experiments um, and so we performed uh, near about 1,500 experiments, wow. um, and, and the most active here was during three years that we did all the experiments. So if you, if you break that down, that's like 500 experiments a year. Um, a year is 365 days, and obviously we don't work every day of the week, so there was a lot of experiments happening. Uh, some were immediately successful, we got good results, some we had to continue, like there were long-term tests, like testing for staling and how long f uh, bread can sit in the freezer before it starts to, dec uh, to basically um, not be palatable, edible anymore. So some took months to, to perform. So uh, flour aging, those are experiments that take longer. But then, like I said, there's some that, you know, within a day they're done, complete, and finished. So. And if we could just kind of step, a, uh, take a step back uh, and go back to the basics of bread, because I have not gotten the courage yet mm -hmm. <laughs> to bake a loaf of bread, and mm -hmm. probably a lot of the home chefs who are listening haven't mm -hmm. either. What are the key ingredients to mm -hmm. a loaf of bread and if you can explain exactly what is yeast mm -hmm. <laughs> sure I, I think you know if somebody is going to start making bread at home mm -hmm. there I would recommend four things that you have four things uh, equipment wise mm -hmm. the first is I like to mix my dough in a rectangular or a square tub um, more than a bowl because the, the reason for this is because once uh, during a stage that's called bulk fermentation, which is you've already mixed the dough and it needs to sit a little bit to ferment and the gluten needs to uh, basically develop, uh, you have to perform what is called a four edge fold, which is basically you lift the dough and you turn, you basically fold it onto itself, which in a rectangle it's easier to do than if it's a bowl. In a bowl it's very hard to, to kind of wrap your brain around that. But also because when you turn the dough out onto a, a lightly floured table, you have this square and it's easier to cut small squares out of a square than if you were to do like a circle, you know, how do you divide that evenly into even pieces and shape that into another, um, into another, uh, like a, a boule or a batard, which are your mm. traditional shapes. But I would also say take your volume measures and teaspoon measures, uh, put them in a bag mm -hmm. and throw them in the garbage. Uh, because <laughs> what you need to do is you need to buy a scale. Um, even though we do have volume measures in the book, mm -hmm. a scale is always going to be more precise than any yeah. sort of measuring uh, cup or teaspoon because manufacturers of volume measures, they don't always agree upon what the size should be. So it's, it's not a across the board that one teaspoon measure of salt from every maker is going to have the same, it's going to hold the same amount. Mm. And it might not matter with 
flour if you have a little bit more, a little bit less, but in things that really matter like salt and yeast, you know, there, sometimes we use such small amounts that not even the smallest measuring spoon mm -hmm. is, is, is small enough for that amount of yeast. So I would <laughs> invest 20 bucks in a scale. Okay. The other thing is a thermometer, a digital thermometer, hmm. uh, because you use it for many reasons. Uh, the, the temperature that you mix your water, the, the temperature of the water when you mix your dough matters uh, because if it's too hot, if the water is too hot, it's going to ferment too quickly. If it's too cold, it's going to take a long time. So you need to get the, the temperature, right? But also a lot of people who just start baking, they don't know when their bread is done. When is it baked, yes. right? So yes. is it a wild guess or do you just hope that it's going to be done? Um, experienced bakers can take a look at the bread when it's baking and just by looking at it say, okay, it's done. Mm -hmm. uh, Less experienced bakers do what is called a thumb test, which is you basically take the loaf of bread out, you do like a thump underneath the loaf, and it makes this like um, particular sound that tells you it's baked. Um, but if you don't know, the surefire way to know if it's baked is you just put a thermometer in the bread, and if it reads between 200 and 208 degrees Fahrenheit, mm -hmm. it's ready to come out. Um, and the fourth piece of equipment that I would definitely invest in is a uh, cast iron cooker. Uh, cast iron combination cooker, which is a cast iron pot, but it's it basically resolves a problem that most hum, home ovens have, which is home ovens aren't very good for baking bread. Uh, you have even the ones that are thousands of dollars. A home oven is meant to bake many things. Mm -hmm. Bread is not its priority. Um, you can you can use it for meats and vegetables and roasting and whatnot, but it's not very good for bread. Uh, it's not very good because you open the door and the temperature is going to drop dramatically just within like seconds of opening the door. If you bake your bread inside a cast iron pan, the cast iron is going to retain that heat and it's going to radiate that heat into the bread better than any oven will ever do. So even if you have a terrible oven, cast iron is going to bake you beautiful. This was baked in a cast iron pot. Wow. So, um, I mean, it, it's when we were testing what the best vessel was and we were just so amazed at how beautiful it turned out. And so you put the cast iron pan or skillet mm -hmm. into it? Preheat it with your, inside your oven. Um, and so, you know, air is the worst conductor of heat. It's the absolute worst. And that's how most home ovens work. It, I mean, in fact, all home ovens work like that, just by conducting heat through air. And that's, I mean, that's, that's the easiest way to, to lose, to drop temperature in your oven. It's also very hard for air to basically transmit that temperature into anything else. Mm -hmm. So cast iron is gonna work the best, but also because cast iron has a, you know, you close the, the thing where you put the bread in, mm -hmm. and it means you don't have to apply any form of steam because the dough produces its own steam within the pot. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you've ever seen when people try to add steam when they're baking bread at home, they use sprayers or they, put ice inside like a pan so that it'll, cr it'll create mm -hmm. steam and it's a very inconsistent way of producing steam. Uh, putting it in the cast iron pot, it just, it, it reduces error by a good 90% um, and it's always gonna be consistent. And you can use a cast iron cooker for many things, not just for bread. So it has many purposes. So that's what I would recommend, like the basic four mm -hmm. things that home bakers should get. We're talking about less than $100 here. Uh, to make great bread. But the other thing too is, you know, that's equipment, but flour is important, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're just starting out, I wouldn't recommend getting like these little uh, boutique style mill flours, which, you know, they, they have very flavorful flours and whatnot, but you don't really know how this flour is going to react when you mix it. Is it going to be, uh, you know, uh, user friendly, if you will? Um, or is it gonna give you all sorts of uh, problems? So I would utilize, uh, just start with white bread flour, uh, some brands that are uh, good to get started with are uh, like King Arthur, Sir Galahad. Um, uh, I really like, there's a mill in California that's called Central Milling, mm -hmm. uh, and they have a, a wonderful flour that is, is called Artisan Baker's Craft, and it, it's, it produces wonderful bread. It's organic, it's malted too. Um, so you get that nice browning on your loaves. Uh, and gold metal, be better for bread. I mean, these are flowers that are available in most parts of the country. Um, they've been tested, they're consistent throughout the year, so there's no like 
you know variation in protein content. It's it's you're it's not a crapshoot every time you mix bread. It's it's gonna it's gonna absorb the same amount of water and it's gonna react very similarly every time. And quick question on the flour. So is it a specific flour for bread yes. or is so you cannot use your regular flour for baking? No. I'm, what matters the most the most important aspect about uh, bread flour is the protein content. Okay. So. Um, the higher the protein content, the stronger the flour is going to be. Okay. So for most breads, we, wanna, we want to have a strong flour. Okay. Uh, we want to have something that is going to produce gluten, which is what makes the dough stretchy, but also that it's going to withstand an expansion and it's going to hold those bubbles as it expands and not rip and tear or deflate. So you want specifically what is called in the United States bread flour. So. Um, all purpose can work, mm -hmm. but all purpose is a catch all phrase for many uh, flour manufacturers where the, the protein percentage varies wildly from one maker to the other. So I would just make it a point to buy bread flour to, to make bread. So. And do you feel like there's a difference between flour from Europe and flour from the U.S.? And in your wonderland mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> cuisine place, uh, mm -hmm. modernist cuisine, did you test those as well? Yeah, there, there are. What, what you need to um, understand when you buy a flour is you need to look at what Mills called a spec sheet, okay. which is... Basically, it's a breakdown of what the flour is made up of. Okay. And if it's, uh, the most important thing you're gonna look for is protein content, okay? So for bread, what we're looking for is 11.5% protein content as a starting point for making bread. It goes all the way up to 14%, but that's probably a little too much. Okay. Um, but you wanna have a high protein content. So our flour is different, they are different. Okay. Um, there's, we did try, uh, flowers from Great Britain. Uh, we had uh, a, f a friend of ours who's a baker there sent us a bunch of uh, of their different flowers so we can test them out, our recipes with them. We got some flowers in from Germany, we got some flowers in from Austria, we got some flowers in from Italy, um, we got some from France as well. And so we, we tested all of these. They're all a little bit different, but not so dramatically that I would say, uh, you know, don't use flowers from, I don't know, Germany. I would say just if it's if it has a strong protein content and if it's, uh, you know, if you, if you read the specs on it and what, what it's made up of, you're going to have a successful loaf of bread. So uh, interestingly, though, like Italian flours are typically what you use for pizzas called double O flour. Um, a lot of those flours are, uh, most of it is, is flours that come from Canada. Um, <laughs> Uh, with a little bit of Italian flour in there, but most of the the strong flours they don't grow in 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 Italy. I mean, they're, yeah. it, I mean, Italy's not really a wheat producing mm -hmm. um, uh, country, and so a lot of the flour that they utilize in their in their bread making comes from Canada. So, okay. um, and Canada makes extraordinary flours as well. So they're very on par with American flours as well. Great. So. Great. So back to the basics, flour is a very important ingredient yeah. and you've given us great instruction for that. What are the other key ingredients that go into bread as well? Well, obviously water, but what we want to really make sure of when we talk about water is that we don't fetishize it like some people do with, for example, they say that only, uh, you can only make good bagels in New York City because of the water there. And that's, that's really bogus, that is not mm -hmm. true at all. Uh, you can make great bagels in Seattle, and you can make great bagels in Phoenix, Arizona. What matters more than the water is the technique and the method of, yes. of making the bagel. Yeah. So um, I would say that the most important thing about water is that if it's, if it's something that you can drink, if it's, if, it's, if it's a safe water to drink, it's a safe water to make bread. Uh, if it's if it's slimy or if it smells funny or if it's that's going to translate into the bread and so just I would probably not use that for for making bread it's going to react strangely with you know how proteins bond to each other and form gluten it might not uh, it, it, it might create a dough that is just not very cohesive so if you're gonna if you can drink it you can make bread with it okay uh, salt matters mostly because it's what adds flavor to bread uh, I mean okay. in it's typically around 2% of the weight of the flour is added in, in salt. Uh, that's like an average percentage. If you look at our recipes, it's right around 2%. Um, salt is salt. Uh, what matters the most about salt is particle size. 
the, the finer the crystal, the easier it's going to disperse and dissolve into the dough. Okay. So you don't want to get like fleur de sel or like large chunk crystals that are probably going to stay as chunks and not really dissolve into the dough. Okay. So you want the finer stuff. Okay. Okay. So, so like the sea salt? Thing? Yeah. Okay. Well, so uh, Nathan would say all salt is from the sea. Okay. Uh, whether it be an ancient ocean that right. evaporated right. or a current ocean. So most, it, it you know, when people hear sea salt, it has a little bit more of like, ah, uh, you know, yeah. it's sea salt, right? <laughs> I've also heard people call like brand their salt organic, even though it's a mineral. But so I mean that these are, these are just nomenclature things that that ultimately salt is salty. Uh, it's all it's more or less the same minerals are are, are what compose salt. But again, the the particle size is what matters the most. Most it could be sea salt, it could be kosher salt, which is a little bit larger size. It could be table salt, which is super fine. It's just you want to look at something that is going to easily dissolve. Can it be pink Himalayan salt? You can, absolutely. Oh, okay. And you can use celery, which is the French uh, okay. sea salt. Just grind it. Uh, I would put it in like a coffee grinder or a spice mm -hmm. grinder just to get the particle size smaller. Because, uh, I mean, it's not that it's a terrible thing that you bite into like a salt crystal, but there's going to be parts that are not as flavorful as other parts mm -hmm. of the dough. Um, and then yeast. And so... Yeast, of course, is the thing that makes the bread the bread. Uh, we baked a bunch of loaves of bread with and without yeast just to see, well, of course we know that the role of yeast is fermentation, but what else does it do? Um, and so a lot of, of the flavors and the aromas that you get from, from bread, uh, yeast is directly responsible for those. So you want to make sure that you have yeast in there, whether it be wild yeast. Uh, if, you, if you start a wild yeast starter, we call it a levan, which is the French term for it. Um, this takes a, a few days. It takes at least like five days to get things started, and then you have to feed it on a regular basis, on a daily basis, but more or less at around the same time every day. And when you say feed the starter, because a lot of us are just starting yeah. with starters, uh -huh. Uh -huh. so what exactly is yeast, mm -hmm. and how do you feed it? <laughs> uh -huh. So yeast is a microorganism, okay. uh, and it's a microorganism that is everywhere. and yeast that is everywhere basically what it is if you if you find yeast on uh, grape mm -hmm. that is a specific type of yeast that likes to eat what is on the grape um, if you find uh, wild yeast in flour mm -hmm. that particular type of yeast likes to eat the sugars that are in the flour so it's it's even though they're everywhere they're specialized to what they like to eat and they adapt to that sort of environment um, so it's a microorganism that feeds on sugars uh, so it's got a sweet tooth mm -hmm. um, and basically every time it eats uh, it produces co2 which basically it produces co2 and ethanol which is it i don't want to get super crass as to what the comparison would be as, as what humans would do but it, it's 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 a gas and it's a liquid that is coming out as uh, the result of consuming these sugars and that is what is in your bread uh, but there's also in, in these, a starter is basically, just to, to give you the basics, the 101 on what a starter is, yeah. is we mix equal parts of water and flour. Mm -hmm. And we, to get things started, we let that sit for like three or four days. You're going to start to see some bubbles happening in there. And what that is, is the yeast has started to basically feed off of the sugars that are in the flour. And what do I mean by feeding it? It means that every day you're going to take about 25% of it, mm -hmm. put it in another container, and add another amount of flour and water. Because it, it will have depleted its food already by a period of 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And so every day we want to give it that amount of food. Mm -hmm. Yeast is an extraordinary um, uh, microorganism that adapts very easily. Um, what I mean by this is that if I feed it every day at around, let's say, 8 o'clock in the evening, it gets used to that. Uh, it's like a pet. It really is because it'll know that, okay, I need to make my food last up until now. And it's not like it's making a rational thought about it. It has adapted to that sort of circumstance. If I start to starve it and I feed it every 36 hours, it'll make the food last 36 hours. If I feed it every 8 hours, it'll know, okay, I got 8 hours before my next meal is coming. Um, but very importantly, in this, in this starter, or Levan, uh, what you have is not just yeast. You have something else that is actually more prevalent than yeast, which is lactic acid bacteria. 
Interesting. And so lac that's milk. Well, okay. no. Well, there's different okay. kinds of lactic okay. acid bacteria, and a lot of people. It's 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 great that you brought that up because a lot of people will add yogurt to their starter because there's lactic acid in it, but it's different forms of lactic acid. Mm -hmm. uh, that the lactic acid in yogurt mm -hmm. likes to be in yogurt. The lactic acid in uh, sourdough starter likes to be in there. So it's it's different forms of mic microorganisms that adapt to their environment. Um, we produce lactic acid when we work out, but it's not the same, it, it's not even, I mean, we wouldn't use that to, right. to add to right. our starter. So, um, but those are the things that produce that sourness, that taste in sourdoughs. Um, and it actually, lactic acid bacteria outnumbers yeast 100 to 1. So we always talk about wild starters, wild yeast, but in reality, lactic acid bacteria is kind of like the key player here uh, for starters. So, uh, and it's what's going to give the unique character to everybody's starter. So for example, if I gave you some of my starter, yeah. like let's say I brought it from Seattle and I said, here, here's this. I give you instructions on how to feed it and whatnot. It's eventually going to change its nature uh, and adapt to whatever lactic acid bacteria is prevalent in your home environment. Um, so it'll it'll have lost the character of my Seattle starter, and it'll become more your Chicago starter. In fact, specific to your home. Um, of course, a lot of it comes from you know the bag of flour that you bought is the yeast that lives in that flour. But what is in the container that you hold it? What is you know after generations and generations of yeast? That is what's going to give it its specific character. This is just fascinating, Chef. And the fact that from those four basic ingredients mm -hmm. with the salt, the yeast, the, um, uh, the flour, and the water. water. Mm -hmm. With those four, you have worked on 1,200 recipes. And we had to, we had to cut 600 <laughs> recipes. Just, and I have to also mention that when I first interviewed with Nathan Mirvold for this position four plus years ago, mm -hmm. in my mind, I'm thinking there's no way we're going to write more than one volume <laughs> about bread because it's four ingredients. I mean, how much... And lo and behold, we're five volumes later, yes. and we had to cut all of those recipes. So that it is a pretty remarkable thing. I mean, I can't think of many things that with four ingredients I can make so many different things with, just by altering proportions, altering fermentation, altering, you know, adding a little bit of this and a little bit of that, how different of a result you can obtain and still call it bread. Wow. So. It's like the pie of bread. Right, sure, yes, <laughs> Absolutely. of course. Mm -hmm. So I love, too, how you really became a Sherlock Holmes mm -hmm. through this whole process. And what was so amazing to read about the discovery in Mozambique oh, on yes. a mm -hmm. stone mm -hmm. of sorghum. sorghum. Can you explain why this is so significant? It's very significant because the uh, the status quo of what the history of bread is, is that, br that bread is depending on who you ask, some will say 5,000 years old, some will say, no, it's 10,000 years old. But we would argue that uh, the, these, this ground up sorghum that was found in Mozambique over 100,000 years ago, why do you grind grains for? Uh, to eat them, right? But you don't grind them and then just take that powder and put it in your mouth. You're going to mix it with water. Mm -hmm. And you mix it with water and you're going to make either a porridge or you're going to make a paste. And you're probably going to cook that paste. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you're going to make a flatbed, or if you make that paste and you let it sit out for a while, there's going to be yeast doing what it does. So our educated guess as to what these um, uh, early humans did with, with the ground uh, sorghum grain was that they made a flatbread with it. Uh, that they made a flatbread that is very similar to uh, this. Uh, it's an Ethiopian flatbread called injera that's made with teff which is also like a super like one of the original grains um and it ferments uh, in a period of 24 hours it's a very it's a very sour it's like a batter like a pancake batter and you pour it onto a hot surface and it cooks mm -hmm. um so our our working theory was that that's what these um ancient humans did which was to, to make these this porridge and then cook it over a hot stone um and they would eat that or they would cook it as an actual porridge uh, there's also the question is as to what was first beer or bread and we we still don't know because you ferment things they're going to produce alcohol and you're either going to drink it or you're going to eat it so um so that that is that is where the whole uh very interesting discovery of of hundred thousand year old sorghum uh ground up sorghum came from so 
That is amazing. And I love how you have such a love of the arts mm -hmm. and how you've been able to combine this journey with the arts and how you and your team mm -hmm. would evaluate old master paintings yes. to mm -hmm. look at the bread mm -hmm. and you would uh, reenact that we not only on the table, but yeah. I, I saw a really fun photo uh -huh. that you did with uh, from Pompeii. Pompeii, yes. <laughs> Uh, it turns out that you know there's there is a lot of bread in art, uh, and interestingly, before this project, we didn't really notice it. But once we started looking, boy, it was like everywhere, and it's it's a very interesting way to see how bread has evolved throughout um, you know man's history. Um, the specific mural you're talking about it is a mural from uh, Pompeii. It's about two thousand years old. And in this mural, there's uh, uh, it's it's basically it's a man giving other people bread, uh, and it's the bread is is a very interesting shape. It looks almost like a flat pumpkin. It's got like segments on it. Um, so we we tried making that bread. Of course, there's no recipe. Uh, I mean, there's what we had was educated guesses as to what flour they may have used, how much water they may have added to it, and how they would have baked it. Um, so we tried a good, I would say, 17 different versions of, of the bread before Nathan was actually happy with one of them. Mm -hmm. um, and the actual uh, final product was this, uh, we utilized uh, semolina flour for it. Um, and it, uh, we actually used these bread stamps. They were uh, bronze stamps that were originally from that time, 2,000 years ago, that bakers used to use to stamp their bread. Um, and so uh, we bought one from uh, Antique Steeler, mm -hmm. and it had the baker's initials on it, and we, we used it. Uh, I mean, just the journey that this bread stamp has been through, yeah. and, and how, you know, 2,000 years later, it's in this ultra-modern kitchen uh, being used again. You know, I mean, that, those are very special moments in, in the life of, of, of this book, where we're able to do things like this. Um, and we did reenact that mural. It took like a month to get everything uh, dialed in, meaning uh, there was this really odd piece of furniture where the, the man was sitting on. It's like sitting on a, on a cabinet, <laughs> handing out bread to people that are below him. And so even the costumes, we had a costume, uh, a woman who specialized in, in, in historical costumes, she designed them and made them for us. Um, we made the bread and so and one of our staff actually built that piece of furniture that that the man is sitting on and so uh, it took a month to organize but it, it probably took five minutes to take a picture <laughs> you know? um, but it, it, yeah you're right I mean th those are really um, it's a very interesting way to look at how bread has evolved to what it is now mm -hmm. and and the future of bread. And I love how you say that the future of bread is even better yes. than the past. Mm -hmm. What trends or what techniques, mm -hmm. ingredients do you see that really supports your mm -hmm. claim on that? So I'm gonna go back a little bit to, uh, there's, there's this romanticization of, um, of how bread used to be better and how, you know, back in the day, bread was better quality and so on and so forth and there's so many holes in that uh, for many reasons first is flour is better now than it's ever been uh, quality wise consistency wise uh, right now you get a bag of flour you know you're getting a bag of flour in the past you know bags of flour were doctored with other things um, that weren't necessarily flour um, talking just about conditions that bakers used to work in it was inhuman to say the least I mean there were there are um, various depictions of bakers that they actually were using their entire bodies to mix a dough like they would be in the dough so first Rolling of all in the dough <laughs> well literally yeah exactly um, first of all it, I mean just how inhuman that is but also how unsanitary that is um, and so there were all of these conditions that that led to uh, you know disease and led to like just very poor quality bread bread used to be very it used to be made mixed with less water than we mix it in now, so it was very dense. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was on purpose because that meant it lasted longer, but also meant it was, re it, if you were, if that was your meal, it was going to be more filling than if you had a bread that had like all of these huge open holes like we are currently used to having right now. Um, ovens are better now than they were. Uh, you know, people really like baking in wood-fired ovens, but 
it's not necessarily the best oven for baking bread. It, it requires a lot of burning trees, which you know has its own you know pros and cons. Uh, some people feel like it's not environmentally very friendly. It, there's a lot of conversations to be had about that, but just from a from a practical perspective, baking a wood fired oven is very complicated. Uh, gas ovens, electric ovens bake much more efficiently and much more quickly than wood fired ovens do. Um, so. What, some of the, the more modern things that have happened to bread is that yes, we have better flour now. Yes. We, have a better, we have better equipment to make it and bake it in. Mm -hmm. um, and as you see, I mean, you, you have, we've been adding more water to flour, so it means we get these, like, more, these lighter loaves of bread. Uh, we don't, our diet doesn't depend on eating bread every day anymore. Uh, people used to get paid in bread. I mean, I mean that, that was your salary, it was like, you're done with your shift, here's your loaf of bread. Uh, in the mid-19th uh, century in France, half your salary was spent on bread. So imagine if you took your, your mm. salary and you spent half of it on bread. We don't need to do that anymore. Of course, there's also the downside, which is like people right now think bread should be a very cheap thing. Um, that it should be this thing that is very cheap. And, and so the industry reacts to that. And so you get this, this industry, they produce bread, which bears very little resemblance mm. to what artisan bread is right. but that's that's what we've been asking for isn't it isn't that we want it to be cheaper and cheaper and cheaper so there's there's a reason why that happens uh, there's a reason why if you go to a fast food restaurant and they charge you a dollar for a hamburger mm -hmm. things need to happen for that hamburger to cost a dollar and for the place to still make money so right. we it's it's kind of our fault that bread got yeah. to that place but it's also up to us to support artisan bakers yeah. And to spend a little bit more on the bread, because it's not just the baker who wins, it's the farmer who wins. Right. Every loaf of bread that is made in the U.S., a farmer gets less than five cents for every loaf of bread. The guy who makes the bag makes about the same amount of money. The insurance that all the people involved in the process for making bread is about seven to eight cents of a loaf of bread. So those people are getting more mm -hmm. than the people who are actually milling, harvesting the flour, milling the flour, and making the bread. So I think the future is, is bright because if it shouldn't be out of the question to spend $5 on a nice loaf mm -hmm. of bread. Uh, it shouldn't, we shouldn't expect, if we go to a restaurant, right? Typically, bread is free, right? right? Uh, it's not really free. It's, it's yeah. The cost of it is kind of mixed mm -hmm. into the, the rest of the stuff that you're eating there. But some restaurants are starting to charge for it. And mm -hmm. some patrons are going, why are people charging for bread? And I would ask, should pasta be free? Should risotto be free? I mean, mm -hmm. what is the difference? Yeah. So the people, people come back with, well, that's something that the chef made. And it's like, well, the baker made the bread. So why, why, why is it cheap? Why should it be free? Why are you so outraged to pay money for a loaf of bread? Um, and I, I, shouldn't, I don't want to, to come off as like bread should become elitist. I think that there's different degrees. There's shades of gray here. Um, and I think it's, it's important to give, you know, artisan bread its place. Yes. Um, I think if, if, we, if we support, uh, you know, bakers and, and if we, we ask for this sort of quality, we should be able to pay for it. So. Absolutely. And I love that, I guess, the etymology of being a breadwinner. Sure, you're right. <laughs> right, of course. So and that. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's, you know, it, it, it has to do with how we perceive things. Um, recently, there was an article that came out. Uh, there's a restaurant in New York City that's now charging $24 for a cup of coffee. Now, I'm not going to make a judgment call on that at all, that's, that's, but it, it's more how we perceive things and what they should yeah. cost. There's going to be people who are going to spend $24 on that cup of coffee mm -hmm. for whatever reason. And, you know, sp spending $5, $10 on a loaf of bread, it seems so outrageous mm -hmm. to a lot of people. And, and we need to understand why that is. Right. So to put it in perspective, too, because I think and I know that your modernist bread collection and listeners and viewers, I'll make sure I have a link on my website for you to purchase this. But I think what's important is you're bringing it back home. So mm -hmm. people have the opportunity and the skill set, the tools, the yes. ingredients, all the recipes of how to make this at home. So what would a typical cost of bread be to make at home? Oh. So once you've bought like the, the basic tools, mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, it, it's pennies what it would cost you to make mm. bread at home. Uh, the highest cost of a loaf of bread is not necessarily the ingredients, it's the time. Yeah. It's your time. Um, and so that's, 
the time to mix it, the time to let it ferment. It's not that when you're fermenting, you're act like staring at it, <laughs> waiting for it to ferment, but you're waiting, you know, time has to go by and then you have to catch the dough in time to bake it and so on and so forth. So it's, it's more of a time thing. If we talk about bakeries, it's it, that time translates into labor costs, right? So there's a higher labor cost than ingredient costs when it comes to making bread because flour is cheap. I mean, even like the most organic, precious right. grain that was milled into a flour is still going to be reasonably cheap. Uh, water is cheap, salt is cheap, yeast, if you're using wild yeast, it's free. Um, and so the, these, these, the, the cost is more about the time that it takes to make the thing. And I think one thing is you're really helping to decrease the time in a bit with this futuristic, and I can't wait for you to hear about this, viewers and listeners, about ba baking bread in a jar. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so this was a really cool thing that we accidentally stumbled upon. Uh, which was a you know can you can you jar bread can you can bread um, and so you know my first fear was like putting a glass jar in an oven is, is this gonna explode or is it gonna make a mess in it um, and so when we when we did our first trial we used uh, really large jars I put panettone dough in it and baked it with the lid on and I mean, I, I put the thing in the oven and I told everybody to just walk away, mm -hmm. like step out of the kitchen for the next 45 minutes because I didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> and so after 45 minutes, it was like baked in the jar. Uh, and then the second terrifying moment was taking it out <laughs> because there's a temperature differential. Sure. If you have a temperature differential, sometimes with glass things, I don't know if you've ever experienced like pyrex shattering oh, on yes. you, right? <laughs> that has more to do with the pyrex touching like cold water or something. And so I thought, well, what if this explodes in my face, you know? Uh, and it didn't. We let it cool down on a rack. Uh, I came back the next day, and the most interesting part was that, yes, it baked, but also the, once it cooled down, it created a vacuum inside the jar. Um, and so that vacuum inside of the jar, what it did was it allowed it to, to create basically an anaerobic environment uh, in which there were uh, mold and bacteria can't survive, can't live. Mm -hmm. um, and so not only that, it will preserve bread. I mean, right now we have breads that have been sitting on a shelf for nine months and they're still like fine. Um, the, the other thing that is very interesting is that it doesn't stale. The bread doesn't stale. And the, the reason that we've uh, uh, learned, that we think the reason why it doesn't stale is because of the vacuum that exists within the jar. So in the vacuum. That you discovered by cooking it in the, right, the right. lid. Yeah, and, and so that, that vacuum is essentially what it does is it, it prevents the water. Just to give you a quick explanation of what staling is. Staling is starch, which is in the flour, likes to be in its crystalline form. Hmm. And whenever it can shed water away and go back to that form, it'll do it. Hmm. Uh, so that's how what staling does. It's hmm. You have a loaf of bread, the water keeps the bread nice and chewy, and the starch, but once that water moves out of the starch, that's when bread starts to become brittle and crumbly. And so that's its water migration. So in the vacuum, the water migration doesn't happen because the water can't move because of the vacuum that is in there. Um, and so it keeps, it keeps it in place. And so we started testing all of our recipes with this method. It doesn't work for every bread. Obviously, if you're looking for a crusty bread, yeah. it's not going to happen because you're in a moist environment. But it works beautifully for enriched doughs like brioche sandwich bread. It worked really well for what we call brick-like breads, mm -hmm. uh, which are Vulcanbrot, Pumpernickel. These are very dense breads. Yeah. So it worked really well in that, in the, for those sorts of breads as well. Um, and the other day, we were just messing around. We baked a bagel in a jar. Too. <laughs> it worked. Uh, we <laughs> baked a pizza in a jar, and it also worked. And so it, it, was, it has a lot of possibilities. Uh, the other thing that we wanted to find and procure is jars that weren't too expensive because yeah. the jars that we were using it's a German brand that makes these beautiful jars you've mm -hmm. probably seen them they have like the the orange gasket and the clips yeah. and so those, they're beautiful but it's not I mean they're like four or five bucks each mm -hmm. and so recently last week we found a much cheaper alternative like 75 cents for a jar yeah. uh, we did a bunch of tests with those and they, they work really well and so it's it's something that is it's a cool gift to give but it, it's also we 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 bake it in an oven, but you can also cook it in a, one of these instant pots uh, in a pressure cooker, and it takes half an hour, uh, half an hour to 40 minutes to, to fully bake like 100, 150 grams of bread. So 
it's it's pretty cool it's a pretty cool way to cook it if you don't have an oven if you have an instant pot i mean that's i didn't know this but instant pot is becoming like super popular recently um and so uh i used to use just a regular pressure cooker but the instant pot is it is awesome <laughs> Uh, because I can set the the PSI, which is a pressure, mm -hmm. and I can set the time that it's going to take to cook, and I put the bread in there and just walk away, and it does its thing. So, um, so there it, there's ways around baking in an oven. There's ways around you know baking in a traditional format for bread. So, and making it last. I mean, those that's because we think bread should be this cheap thing. We throw it away when it's not like perfect anymore. Instead mm -hmm. of you know, either refreshing it in an oven or making crumbs out of it, or, uh, you know, you can use it to thicken soups. You can use it to make panzanella, which is a tomato salad. There's many things you can do to bread before you throw it away. Um, and what is a tip? Because I'm always, right now I'm purchasing bread, but you've inspired me to try making my own bread. And I think for um, the holiday gifts, I might try to make it in the jar. But what are some tips at home? And Because it seems like it goes stale, it gets moldy so mm -hmm. quickly. Is it best refrigerated? Is it best stored in like a glass? I mean, the right. bread basket? I mean, what so we, we tested all of those things. Yes. Uh, the first question that we had, and, and we hadn't really asked ourselves this before this book, is like, what is the function of a bread box? Hmm. It, except for holding the bread in, yes. it doesn't extend its shelf life for any reason. Uh, if your concern is, you know, flies and vermin getting into it, that's a different problem. Right. Uh, but refrigerating is not good for bread. Uh, if you refrigerate bread, it's going to stale faster. It actually accelerates staling. Because the water. Because of the water, okay. yes. It, it actually in, in, it, it accelerates that water migration mm -hmm. happening. Um, but uh, let's see, uh, freezing is probably the best way to, oh. to preserve your bread because let's say you have like a, a round loaf of bread, mm -hmm. right? Something like this. Yes. Um, there's a couple of things you can do. One is you can wrap the whole thing and just put it in the freezer. That would entail pulling it out and letting it thaw and then refreshing it in, in an oven. Uh, like the whole thing but it's probably better if you slice it first and what we recommend is slice it and then wrap it in in sets of of however many slices you think you're going to consume in one given moment so a loaf like this probably gives us a dozen slices okay. so I would probably freeze it in in four four slice oh, packs okay. so that this way it'll thaw faster because the slice thaws faster I can toast it and bring it back to life and then I still have bread in the freezer I don't have to defrost the whole thing um, so freezing is hands down the best way of extending the life of your bread. Um, there's also ways of, to reverse staling. Oh. Um, so let's say you brought a sourdough or a baguette, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, baguettes actually stale very quickly. Like in less than 24 hours, you're going to noticeably tell that it's, yes. it's starting to stale. And they put your teeth in danger. <laughs> sure, of course. And, and it cuts the roof of your mouth and so. Yes. Um, the best thing to do with this, uh, we found, to bring a bread back to life is you wrap the whole thing in aluminum foil um, and then you put it in an oven. You put it in an oven, like 350 degrees or so, and then you're going to let it sit in there until the core temperature reaches 195 degrees Fahrenheit. This is going to be just enough temperature to reverse staling and your bread is almost going to be as good as new because you had it wrapped in the foil um, and so the foil is going to prevent it from drying out on the outside so it's not going to get like crustier mm -hmm. what's going to happen is it's going to it's going to reverse that staling and it'll your bread will be almost as good as new so it's it's a great way to not like throw the bread away just wrap it well in foil put it in an oven use that thermometer that i told you about earlier and then just put it in there after like 10 minutes and if it once it reaches 185 degrees fahrenheit i say that temperature specifically because that's the temperature at which starches cook at so um, you don't need to go hotter than that. Okay. It's not going to kill it if it goes a little bit higher than that, but you want to get to at least 185 degrees Fahrenheit. That is great. Now, here at Kitchen Chat, and thank you listeners for all your questions, too. A couple of questions have come up. Okay. Emily uh, from her Instagram is at West of the Loop. Mm -hmm. Ask, what can she do with the leftover starters? Because she doesn't want to waste. Do you have to throw it away, or what happens? That's a, I love that question because that is that happens a lot. We actually did the math. It didn't take that long to do it. If you feed your starter every day, mm -hmm. at least you have one of those small 8-ounce jars. Yes. Um, if you feed it every day, it's about 250 grams of flour, which is like uh, 8 ounces of flour, 8 ounces of water. The water is not a big deal. It's the flour. 
Anyway, at the end of a year, you will have gone through 100 pounds of flour just to feed this starter. So one thing that we like to do with it is uh, we have what we call second chance sourdough. Uh, so second chance sourdough utilizes, instead of throwing it away, put it in a Ziploc, flatten it as much as you can, and freeze it. So it may, the yeast within it may have been spent, but what you have in it are two very important things, which is flavor, uh, and you also have flour that has been hydrated. And why does this matter? It matters because it'll reduce your mixing time. Okay. So we, in our recipe, we utilize this basically dead, spent mm -hmm. starter, uh, and we add a pinch of commercial yeast to it mm -hmm. once we mix the dough. So basically, you're, you're taking the good, flavorful parts of the, st of the sourdough, but you're helping it out with some commercial yeast. And it turns out a beautiful loaf of bread. I mean, it really is... Just by adding that little bit of commercial yeast, A, you don't waste the flour, you don't waste your starter, um, and you're able to make a beautiful loaf of bread. And it, and, and it just, it, it's exactly, it tastes exactly like any sourdough bread. You just were more uh, frugal and, and more thrifty with, with, your, with your flour instead of throwing it away. And I, and I love that people think that way because it is important to do that. Now, how many times can you do that, right? I mean, how many times can you freeze this, this Ziploc of bread and... So I would recommend that you, you do freeze it. Uh, if you, ideally, if you wanted to start, like just keep starter available, what we recommend is, let's say you're not making bread every day. Take your starter, feed it, and after about four or five hours when it starts to bubble, when there's some yeast activity, what we do is we like to spread it very thinly on a mat and dry it out, okay? So what you're basically doing what industrial yeast producers are doing, but at a very small scale. So we dry it out. Um, if you have a dehydrator, it's, that's great because you can set it to a very low temperature without having it be too aggressive on the yeast. You dry it out um, and then you grind that. You put that in a, a jar and you keep that in your fridge. Basically what you have is a, a dehydrated starter. Uh, and within a couple of days of adding water to it, even less than that, you're going to have your starter back to life. Wow. Now, people keep a jar of their starter in their fridge. And let me tell you this. <laughs> uh, after five days, that thing's dead. Um, and you're going to see there's a layer, a film of water on top. I mean, this, this starter is, is no more. Um, and so people are like, yeah, but I feed it. And after like five days, it's back to life. What you really did is you started again. <laughs> it, it, there's the initial thing that you had in there five days later has become something else completely it's become a new starter so um, so again the best thing to do if you can dry it out keep the powder in the fridge and then it'll only take a couple of days to bring it back to life and then you can use it again you keep like make a bunch of it and just keep it in your fridge right. so and I can't wait to hear the answer of this question. The tease that we began at the beginning was how many bubbles are there in a loaf of bread? Uh -huh. I love this question because I, I'm going to answer it and then I'm going to explain to you why. Okay. There is, you look at a loaf of bread, you cut into it and you're like, oh, there's a ton of bubbles here. In reality, it's one bubble. It, they're all interconnected bubbles. And this has to do with how steam works. It's, it's a physics property that's called um, heat, uh, uh, heat pipes, the heat pipe effect, um, or steam pipe effect, rather. And so what this means is that when your bread is baking, the bubbles that are on the surface of the bread are going to get hot first because obviously the heat is coming from the outside. So that bubble contains some water. So that water eventually is going to become uh, hot enough, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, to basically turn into steam and travel to the next bubble that is right next to it. Hmm. But it has to burst, like that bubble bursts before it gets to the next bubble, and that, then that one bursts and gets to the next bubble and so forth. Uh, so they're all interconnected. It has to happen that way because that's steam wants to travel to where it's coolest, not to where it's hottest. So where is it coolest? Towards the center of the dough. Hmm. So once all of these bubbles have gone into that temperature and popped and then the made the one below it or next to it or uh, close to it 
hot again and popped and so on and so forth till it gets to the core, then at that point when there are no more bubbles to pop, then the steam is going to start to make its way out. Uh, and that's how you get a crusty loaf of bread. It's because the steam will, will come out and it will form this like crust on the outside of your bread. So it's one bubble. So next time you, you cut into your loaf of bread, <laughs> this is more obvious with larger crumb breads like ciabatta or sourdoughs or baguettes. Um, you'll see that everywhere that there's a bubble, there's a rupture. Uh, there's, a, there's a part where it has a rupture in it. Um, and that is the steam that is traveling to the next bubble to do the same thing to the next bubble. And so it's, it's, it's a very interesting effect that happens on the, on the oh, dough. This is just fascinating. I could listen for hours and hours about yeah, I could the- talk I, hours and hours about it. <laughs> oh, but I, I'm so excited listeners because there is a new podcast and we all like listening and learning. And can you tell us about your new podcast at Modernist? Yes, uh, we're, it's a podcast that we're doing. It's called uh, Modernist Breadcrumbs. Uh, and the host is Michael Harlan Turkel. Uh, he's he's an awesome guy. I mean, they, he has his own podcast. It's called The Food Scene. Mm-hmm. And he interviews a bunch of chefs and food personalities, authors, etc. Uh, and they pitched this idea to us to do, to do this podcast. Uh, and it's not just us talking. They talk to a bunch of other bakers. They talk to farmers, millers. And it's a, I think it's eight series, eight part mm-hmm. series. Um, it may, it may be seven, but um, I, I think it's up to eight now. Um, and it, it's a deep dive into not just the book, but bread making in general and, and the people who have basically had an effect on the, on the world of baking. So. Well, I know at your modernist cuisine, and they call it the Wonder Lab, mm-hmm. <laughs> Wonderland Lab, mm-hmm. um, there's also a gallery mm-hmm. of, yeah. f- of artists. I mean, do you think there's going to be a whole new gallery of bread p- paintings of bread <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know I mean certainly I mean it, there's a lot of these these paintings are very old and therefore very yeah. expensive uh, <laughs> but uh, I mean I I don't know Nathan has um, he has he opened a gallery in Las Vegas mm-hmm. that is is just of the photography it's of photography for that was in our books but he also created uh, unique photography for the gallery um, and so I mean it, they're available for purchase there uh, but yeah, we have like a mini museum in our lab of like just bread paraphernalia and, and, and some antiques that we utilized and, and so on and so forth. It's, it's in our library, within our, our book library, which is it's a pretty cool place too. So. Oh, and for your own book library, foodie friends, highly recommend the new Modernist Bread. You, with the five volumes, get ready to get your weight lifting and create <laughs> lactic acid, yes, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> hey, that's a really good point. Yeah. <laughs> and, and lifting it, but it'll be a great addition to your home library. And make sure you send pictures of the bread that you're making in your home and, and share that as well. Chef Francisco Magoya, thank you so much for being on Kitchen Chat. Yeah, you know, this was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you. And thank you, dear foodie friends, for joining me on this culinary journey. I'd love for you to keep in touch, kitchenchat.info and Facebook Kitchen Chat. And always remember to take a moment and savor the day.